Welcome everyone. It's 1131 and we're going to get started in just a moment. We'll be wrapping up by 1 p.m. Son las 11.31 y vamos a comenzar en unos momentos para poder cerrar a la una. It's my pleasure to introduce Javi Infante Varas and Naira Pacheco Guzman from Rooted Language Justice, who will now review how to access Spanish interpretation for the webinar. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Javi. I am here from Rooted Language Justice, and I will be orienting everyone on to use the interpretation feature for this webinar. I will do this message in Spanish first and then in English. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Javi. Voy a ser una de las intérpretes esta mañana con mi colega Naira. La justicia del lenguaje es una práctica importante para el CEC. Les recordamos que este seminario web será interpretado en inglés y en español. La función de interpretación ya está activada. Si está conectado de, desde una computadora, va a haber un globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la ventana de Zoom. Si está en un dispositivo móvil, va a haber tres puntitos en la esquina a mano derecha. Va a hacer clic en interpretación de idiomas y seleccionar el idioma que prefiere. Si no es bilingüe en inglés y en español, debes escoger un canal de idioma. Les pedimos a los oradores que hablen a un paso moderado y que expliquen o deletreen las siglas la primera vez que se mencionan. Gracias, y ahora le voy a dar el, la orientación en inglés. Good morning, everyone. My name is Javi. I am here from Rooted Language Justice, and I will be one of the interpreters for you uh, on this webinar with my colleague, Naira. The language justice is an important practice for CEC. We remind you that this webinar will be interpreted into English and Spanish. The interpretation feature is now activated. If you're on a computer, you will see a globe at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you're connected from a mobile device, you will see a three dot menu at the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Click on these and select the language you prefer. If you are not fully bilingual in both English and Spanish, you must select a language channel. We ask speakers to please speak at a moderate pace and spell or explain acronyms when they are first mentioned. Thank you, and we will now pass it over to the host, and we may now begin to use the interpretation feature. Muchas gracias. Podemos comenzar. Thank you, Javi. All right, so we're going to get started. Um, my name is Molly Taylor. I am the Climate Smart Agriculture Program Manager at the Community Environmental Council. Today's webinar topic is prescribed grazing for ecological and wildfire resilience. This is part of the Community Environmental Council's Putting Nature to Work webinar series. I want to thank you all for being here to learn why prescribed grazing and the recently introduced SB 675 is so critical to wildfire resilience here on the Central Coast and across California. Thank you in advance to today's speakers, Senator Monique Lamone, Jenya Schneider from Koyama Lam, Aaron Kreisberg from Channel Islands Restoration, and Brian Shove from California Climate and Agriculture Network. This virtual meeting is taking place in what is known as California, home to nearly 200 tribal nations. We acknowledge and honor the, inhabit the original inhabitants of our many regions. Um, we are coming to you from Chumash lands and we welcome you to add your own acknowledgement to the chat if you would like. As we get started, a little bit of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded. You will receive a link to the recording and other resources after the event. This is an active session and your engagement is encouraged. We invite you to add questions to the Q&A during the present presentations and we'll answer them as we are able to during the webinar and in the Q&A sessions. We have a CEC support team here to help us, including Jillian and Nicole, who are running the technical side of things. Kristen, who you'll see as a panelist, and Katie, who is monitoring the chat and the Q&A as an attendee. For those of you who are new to CEC or haven't heard what we've been up to recently, we're going to share a video in a moment that actor Jeff Bridges recently did with us. As we get that queued up, we'd love to hear a bit more about you and how you already take part in climate action. Please answer the quick poll that will pop up on your screen. The responses will remain anonymous. 
So the poll questions are, do you participate in climate change advocacy? And do you own or lease an electric vehicle? Do you take part or do you take the climate into account when buying groceries or dining out? And which future webinar would you be most interested in attending? Droughts, fires, mudslides, heat waves, these are the signs of climate chaos that threaten our homes, jobs, and very lives on the Central Coast. We are the Community Environmental Council, and we believe in a world where everyone is safe from climate chaos, no matter your zip code, your day job, or the color of your skin. We need everyone. Are you in? Join us at CECSB.org to end climate chaos now. So just to share the, the poll results quickly, about 43% um, said that they engage in climate change advocacy frequently. 67% um, said that they own or lease an electric vehicle. And 48% say that they um, frequently take climate into action, into account when buying groceries. And 44% said that they would be interested in attending a future webinar on building climate resilience to extreme heat. <clears throat> Next slide. All right, so to set the stage for why we are here today, um, we are gonna be discussing the California wildfire problem. Um, for many of us, the Thomas fire in this region was a catalyst that awakened a new awareness of the pressing issue of wildfire in California today. When the Thomas fire burned in 2017, it was the largest fire since 1889. It is now the ninth largest, having been surpassed by seven larger ones in the subsequent five years. In 2020 alone, 4.3 million acres burned in California. Many of us can remember the apocalyptic photos of San Francisco blanketed in an orange cloak of smoke covering citizens wearing face masks to protect themselves from both COVID-19 and the incredibly poor air quality. From the 2020 fire season alone, 1.140 million tons of carbon dioxide was released. This is equivalent to over 30,000 passenger vehicles driven for a year. So why is this happening? Due to a history of fire suppression over the last century, forests are now six to seven times as dense as they once were. They are filled with more smaller trees that compete for resources in an increasingly hot and dry environment. Next slide. But we do have a solution and that's what we'll be discussing today. So that solution is prescribed grazing what is prescribed grazing? Prescribed grazing is the planned placement of livestock, such as sheep and goats, on the land to reduce fuel load or achieve certain ecological goals, such as habitat restoration or invasive species eradication. Today, we will be learning more about SB 675, the prescribed grazing for fire prevention bill that is part of CEC's 2023 policy platform and has been authored by Senator Monique Lamone. Next slide. I am very pleased to introduce Senator Monique Lamone, who has become an amazing advocate for nature-based wildfire solutions and recently announced that she will be authoring this bill, SB 675. We are lucky to get some time with her today to hear more about the development of this bill and why it matters. So I will pass it off to Senator Lamone. 
Thank you, Molly, and thank you to the CEC uh, for, for moving, uh, putting this together and allowing us to, to come together. So uh, grateful to the Community Environmental Council and the Cal California Climate Agricultural Network uh, to be able to partner with you. And I'm excited that I get to talk just to you a little bit about uh, Senate Bill 675. It's a bill that I introduced this year around ecological grazing. Um, last year, I was able to take a tour of the Arroyo Hondo Preserve with the Santa Barbara Land Trust, the CEC, CalCan, uh, and others where we discussed ecological grazing for vegetation management. Uh, you know, I recall having a conversation, being out on the preserve, uh, and just looking around our environment um, and what it would take uh, for us to be able to manage it in such a way where we didn't, we, we kept, you know, the core and foundation of, of what makes that area so special, but also prepared for the reality that we're having extreme weather um, and that that weather is creating uh, either a whole lot of rain um, or a whole lot of dry conditions. And those dry conditions have led to some of California's largest wildfires. And so being in the moment and really thinking about what it would take and talking about ecological grazing um, and uh, you know vegetation management altogether was really the impetus, I think, for thinking about can we move legislation forward as a community, as a state that protects our environment um, but also prepares us for the reality of living in a world where we're having these major magnitude scale like uh, wildfires happen all over. You know, through that tour, I saw how local partners work together in benefit of our environment and our community. And that was so critical to, to kind of conceptualizing what we could do in terms of working on a legislative bill. Uh, as wildfires have become more frequent in our state, they're larger, they're significantly more destructive. And just in the last five years, they've impacted over 9 million acres. Uh, and so that is uh, a lot of acres in our state. And our county certainly has not, is, has not and is not a stranger to these wildfires. Uh, when I think back as, you know, as someone who was born and raised here, I think back to my first uh, experience, uh, you know, with the wildfire, which was Painted Cave. But um, we've certainly had Painted Cave, the Saka Fire, uh, Thomas Fire, among many um, other wildfires. And one of the solutions to thinking more about how frequent these wildfire cycles happen is our understanding that we need better vegetation management. Uh, but certainly, even in Santa Barbara County and Ventura County along the Central Coast and in other parts of our state, we see that there are different ecosystems. Um, and, and those ecosystems require us to think differently about how we manage uh, you know, the vegetation there. Uh, what works best in the Sierras may not necessarily be what works best along the Central Coast in Ventura, Santa Barbara counties, or other places. And in the state legislature, we've had a number of conversations. Uh, I have been here since 2017, and every year we have had task force committees, legislation that thinks about the impact of wildfire, but also the prevention and what are some of the tools that as communities we can create uh, to be able to to mitigate these negative impacts that we're seeing. We've had conversation about prescribed burning and certainly um, how expensive it can be. It's not always appropriate for the landscapes um, if the areas burn too closely or certainly within a, a, a very close frequency to homes. Um, we've talked about mechanical vegetation management um, and that certainly depends on the location and how accessible that is. Um, and, and certainly there are concerns that there are more uh, causes for GHG emissions um, with mechanical vegetation management. We've talked about home hardening um, and defensible space as an important part of a solution for, as a statewide um, so solution uh, that we can uh, do more without doing some of the vegetation management. And then we've talked about all of these in combination, right? Um, and, and what that would be. And so it, I think, it's been important as state leaders and lawmakers to be able to identify more tools to deal with vegetation management. SB 675 ensures that ecological grazing becomes one of those tools for the state. This bill ensures that ecological grazing projects are included in our state wildfire funding. Up until uh, this date, we haven't um, you know, been so direct 
and forward in terms of funding this type of tool. And so we think it's really important to move in that direction. It will make sure that there's necessary um, and important um, initiatives like this one that can be advanced through payments like fencing and water sources for the animals. And certainly when I took my tour at Arroyo Hunter Preserve, there was a lot of the conversation and what it takes to actually do the proper fencing um, and also water resources um, for this particular tool. In addition, Senate Bill 675 uh, updates the regional forest and fire capacity program to develop local and regional grazing plans. Um, these plans would be eligible for funding and develop guidance for these plans. Um, and guidance for these plans would be developed so that more local governments can utilize ecological rate grazing methods. Um, and finally, this bill directs the state wildfire and forest resilient task force to de develop a plan for extended use of ecological grazing. I think that this is a really important tool. We know that one size does not fit all um, when it comes to vegetation management and other things for that matter. Um, but additionally, we also think that it's about creating more tools to put um, you know, in front of local governments, in front of municipalities to be able to address uh, the wildfires that we're seeing come to us um, in, in really big ways. Uh, again, to me, this is something that is coming from the district. It's been developed um, with, the, you know, some of the folks here um, to be able to address the issues that we have in our state, but also to be able to give us a statewide tool that can be applied in a more local and regional way, which I think is very, very, very key um, to this. So I want to thank you all for allowing me to uh, just share a little bit about what the bill does, my reasons uh, for moving it forward, uh, and certainly want you to know that you are all partners in how we think about um, our environment and what are some of the tools that we can draw upon um, as, as we face serious problems, particularly around wildfires. So thank you so much, Molly. Thank you uh, to again to the Community Environmental Council um, and uh, to our Cl California Climate Agricultural Network, who have been really, really key supporters in making this idea become a policy reality. Thank you, Senator Lamone. Um, thank you for taking the time to spend with us today and getting um, into the topic of SB 675. Um, we're going to move on now to hear from a boots on the ground perspective from a local grazing contractor, um, Kuyama Lam. So I'm happy to introduce Jenya Schneider, who will present. Hi, everybody. I'm Jenya Schneider. I'm an owner operator at Kuyama Lam. Um, we're a targeted grazing service that operates throughout Santa Barbara County since 2018. And I'm going to talk with you about what some of our fire fuels and ecological uh, management projects have looked like over the last few years. Next slide. So I won't speak too much about this project because we have Aaron with us, who's going to share more about it next. But um, our work at the San Marcos Foothills Preserve has been one of our biggest joys and honors um, to be part of a native grassland restoration project. Um, native grasslands are one of the most endangered ecosystems in California, so we're really honored to get to be in service to them here. Um, if you go to the next slide, I will show you, uh, just see if, you, if your eyes notice a difference between the left side of this photograph and the right side. Um, and now you can go to the next slide to see. This right here is three months after our first year of treatments um, in 2019. And on the left side, you can see this is July, so it's the heat of summer, and yet these bunch grasses are tall and green. Um, they have space around them, which is how bunch grasses naturally grow. And on the right side, you can see an untreated and ungrazed area where you can't even really make out the bunch grasses. And that's because they are covered in what we call thatch, which is years of buildup of invasive annual grasses. So they tend to take over um, and cover up those bunch grasses. And with disturbance, which can be grazing or fire, um, those bunch grasses are clear, healthy, they have all the space they need to grow, 
and some bare ground around them to drop seeds, which are the conditions that those seeds need to sprout. Um, and I'll let Aaron talk more about that project later. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, mostly, I just wanna share with you what some of our fire fuel mitigation work looks like. Um, and invasive weed management often goes hand in hand. So we'll kind of do those at the same time. Um, first, there's just some photos from our work at Parma Park. And if we go to the next slide, we'll have some zoom ins. This is just my brief plug um, to say there, uh, sometimes it is thought that goats are the only ones who eat shrubs and sheep only eat grass. And I just want everybody to know that sheep also love shrubs as evidenced by this beautiful sheep eating these shrubs here. Um, so we do work, you know, in, in different ecosystems and, um, but often we are in, you know, annual ecosystems. There's a lot more to be said about that, um, but let's go to the next slide to take a look at more of our work. This photograph is from this past summer up in Tepesque Canyon. Um, so this is an example of a combination invasive weed fire fuel mitigation. On the left, you can see how dense the dead vegetation is, and you can imagine how quickly a wildfire could spread in that area. Um, and on the right side, you can see what it looks like after grazing. There's a lot of material has both been removed by the sheep consuming it, and material is trampled on the ground. Um, you also see the invasive species um, of star thistle here, and that gets most seed, like upwards of 90% of seed um, from invasive weeds is shown to degrade inside the rumen of the sheep so that by the time it comes out their other side, over 90% is no longer viable. Um, and there's also techniques that we use like purging the animals with weed-free hay when we are working in uniquely, um, with uniquely invasive species that we uh, don't want to spread to any other areas. Um, but just in the grazing of an area, we can do a lot to reduce the presence of invasives and to encourage more biodiversity. Um, next slide, please. This is um, very typical for people who live in Santa Barbara to see these stands of dead black mustard stalks. In the spring, they're beautiful yellow flowers on the hillside. Um, and in the summer, they die into these dead stalks. They also have the tendency to push out all other species. Um, so you get a homogenous stand of black mustard stalks that doesn't let anything else grow. So you can see our fence line here in between the incredibly dense stand of mustard stalks, which clearly doesn't let anything else grow, barely lets mustard grow at this point. And um, on the right side of the first photograph or on the bottom photograph, you can see what it looks like after the sheep have been in there. Um, and when we're able to work these areas year after year, that allows a whole new set of biodiverse um, plants to come in and to transition that area away from mustard, which is beneficial both ecologically as well as for um, wildfire. Next slide, please. Um, here's a, a similar situation. Instead of having so much mustard, these are thistles, Italian, thistle and milkweed, I mean, a milk thistle, excuse me, um, two different invasive uh, thistles. And so here we see on the left side uh, or the lower part of the hillside, a, a treated area and where we're moving to the upper portion of the hillside and what it looks like close up, again, just incredibly thick stand of thistles and the lower picture, you see some woody stems remaining, but the vegetation extremely thinned and allowing for sunlight and resources to be shared amongst um, other plants in the understory. Um, and amazingly, and fortunately, sheep love the leaves and seeds of the dead thistles and they will uh, treat them thoroughly, as you can see here. Next photo or slide. 
Um, here's a site, the Vedanta Society in Santa Barbara. Um, these are non-native feather grass bunch grasses, untreated on the left and after treatment on the right. So you can see how thoroughly those have been grazed down. And in the next slide, you can see again, kind of before, during treatment and after. So the material that's removed, it's, it's years of dead material that is getting removed, um, which does a lot for wildfire, um, decreasing intensity and danger of wildfires. Um, but the vegetation isn't harmed. In fact, bunch grasses love to be grazed, need to be grazed or have fire on them. So you can see this is just a week or two after treatment, and there's already green growth coming back on those bunch grasses um, and on the shrubs. So they're putting fresh growth out. <clears throat> that fresh growth is gonna contain more water and be much less flammable in the event of wildfire. Um, and these bunch grasses, these ones are, are not very palatable. They don't have a lot of nutritional uh, value to them at this time of the season. So in the next slide, I'll show you a technique we use sometimes. Um, sometimes we, we use alfalfa or other haze um, at one supplement our sheep when we're working in areas that have a lot of dead material that we're treating um, and that has poor nutritional value. So this serves to feed our sheep what they're not getting from this rangeland, as well as to bring them into areas that they otherwise might not um, get into as much. So on the left side, you can see just how dense this dead <laughs> vegetation is. Um, there's not a lot of reason for our animals to get into that and trample it. But when we put the alfalfa, they get very excited. They trample all this dead material um, and eat what they can. On the right side, this is another area that was endless mustard stalks. They were all quite old and didn't even have seed or any leaf left on them. So there wasn't much for the animals to eat. So we use alfalfa to encourage them to trample it, um, which just completely changed that, that landscape there. Uh, next slide. So we had the very educational experience um, in 2021 when the Alisol fire came through to get to wildfire um, on some of our grazed and ungrazed areas. Um, this, it, it came right through one of our, our home ranch and neighboring ranches. And so here's a video of the fire moving through an ungrazed area. This is grassland and thistle and mustard. So you can see how high the flames are, how much smoke they're producing. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't a very windy day, but the fire at that size really creates wind and moves very quickly and erratically. Um, the next video as well. They're very short videos because when you're in the middle of a wildfire, uh, you don't feel like a lot of time to take videos. But there should be one more. This is also an ungrazed area, largely mustard stalks. You can see just how much smoke and how that is not a flame you would feel safe approaching. Um, in the next video, the next video is gonna be an area that we did graze. Um, and you can see how much lower the flames are and how slow it is moving. There's not any extra wind created. The smoke is much less dark and black. And this flame, you really could like stamp out with your boot. You could step over it if you wanted. It's just a complete different intensity and speed of movement. And this was a, a relatively light to kind of middle uh, intensity grazing in this area. Um, you can go to the next slide, which shows what the Alisol fire did in some other areas that we grazed, where basically the fire just stopped when it got to the grazed areas. 
So here's two examples of that, where the fire, um, there were ungrazed areas in the neighboring um, parcels, and it just stopped when it got to the areas we had treated. And, and then, is there a next? Oh, that's everything. So yeah, I look forward to reading and answering your questions. And uh, thank you to everybody for your time. Thank you, Jenya. That was amazing. Those videos are really compelling. I remember when you shared them right after the Al Sal fire, it was, it was very eye-opening. Um, all right, so we are now going to hear from Aaron Kreisberg of Channel Islands Restoration Group. Aaron has been working at the San Marcos Foothill Preserve, monitoring native bunch grass abundance and uh, ground nesting bird habitat um, in areas that were grazed by Kuyama lamb. Uh, so this is an ongoing part of um, an ongoing effort to promote native biodiversity and reduce wildfire risk at the preserve. So I welcome Aaron to present on his findings. Hey, Molly, thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm Aaron Kreisberg, the staff ecologist at Channel Islands Restoration. And just a quick little background on Channel Islands Restoration. We are a Santa Barbara based 501c3 nonprofit that has done work on the Channel Islands across all eight and um, on the adjacent mainland. So mainly Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, but even reaching down into Los Angeles County and some areas north um, also. Um, and our main emphasis is on biodiversity and protecting plant and animal species and restoring the habitat they are dependent on. And you're certainly welcome to check out our website for more information. Uh, next slide, please. So I will be concentrating on the San Marcos Foothills project that Jenya mentioned. And so um, I will bear with me if I get distracted by little things popping up in the bottom too, but San Marcos Foothills, um, Jenya teed it up for me a little bit, and I imagine all of you who are in Santa Barbara are familiar with San Marcos Foothills, but for I know we have some folks in the audience who are a little further afield. So just to give you some context on San Marcos Foothills, it's located kind of to the northwest of the city of Santa Barbara between the Los Padres National Forest and the city of Santa Barbara and the cities of Goleta, east of Highway 154, and it's really a remnant grassland where a lot of the similar habitats kind of in the foothills area were developed. So this really is a remaining jewel that we have. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of the land demarcations momentarily. Um, but next slide, please. So San Marcos foothills specifically kind of beyond the regional context, you might have noticed on that last slide kind of the watershed. So this is all within the Goleta Slough watershed. So draining from the San Ynez Mountains in the north all the way down to the Goleta Slough east of the UC Santa Barbara campus. So Atascadero and Cienaguitas Creek drain through this property along with a portion of San Antonio Creek. And to speak a little bit to kind of the, I won't dwell on this too long, but to speak to the San Marcos foothills kind of land demarcation. So San Marcos Foothills Preserve is a County of Santa Barbara owned property. You can see that outlined in green on the um, map to your right. And then to the left is the West Mesa. You'll hear me refer to that. Um, the West Mesa is still privately owned actually, technically majority by CIR along with another foundation partner. And it was the ob subject of a very community driven campaign um, which resulted in the preservation of that property. It was actually going to be developed for 15 houses. So it actually was a successful campaign that has prevented that from occurring. So more open space for wildlife to enjoy and also less houses in a hazardous fire zone. So, and then you can see there are some additional property considerations, a couple soaring associated properties, but effectively you can think of 200, 200 acres owned by the county, 100 acres currently owned by partners, but will be transferred to the county in the near term. Um, in regards to habitat, and I do want to touch on that a little bit. So on the San Marcos Foothills Preserve, there's about 50 acres of grasslands and they are semi-contiguous, but really kind of a wide U-shape, whereas the West Mesa, about 100 acres of grassland, and you can see largely contiguous. And then also some riparian habitats, some coastal sage scrub, even a little bit of chaparral on the property. Um, next slide, please. So the objective and hypothesis behind our program that we worked on with Kuyama Lam 
was primarily can prescribed grazing be used to affect structural change in the grasslands of San Marcos foothills to both benefit wildlife at large, but also specifically to benefit grassland dependent bird habitat. And I'll discuss the bird aspect towards the end of the presentation. But you can see here two photos of the San Marcos foothills preserve. They are different seasons, obviously one being in the spring there after rain on the top and more of a fall photo on the bottom there. Um, the bottom photo you can see is relatively perennial grass, lots of purple needle grass, which you'll hear me talk about. So the state grass of California, bunch grass, a native perennial bunch grass, whereas the top photo is largely dominated by non-native annual grasses. So they grow in the season and then die at the end of the year and leave that thatch layer that some of the other speakers have touched on. Um, and so that was the primary hypothesis behind this program, was can that grazing affect structural change in the grassland where it won't just be a tall monoculture of non-native annual grasses, and can there be some structural change that will benefit wildlife and specifically grassland birds? Next slide, please. So some background on the program and the funding that supported this program. So there was grazing on San Marcos Foothills Preserve, the county owned parcel from 2019 to 2021, all done with Cuyama lamb, all done with sheep. Um, one grazing event in 2019, two grazing events in 2020, one grazing event in 2021. And then there was no grazing on the property last year. And then actually this year, we did a grazing event on the West Mesa. So that property I discussed, that was the subject of the community campaign that will be transferred into the county parcels. So some of the funding supporters for the 2019 to 2021 program, which is what I'm going to mainly discuss. Um, so there was support from the US Fish and Wildlife Service, who they're partners in Fish and Wildlife Grant program. We also had support from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and also the County of Santa Barbara provided some funding support. And in addition to grazing, we did do a grassland restoration project of about 10 acres on the San Marcos Foothills Preserve to um, try to increase the composition of purple needle grass and some other native grassland species, which grassland species, I should point out, encompasses beyond just grass species. There's other annual forbs and other elements, constituent plants to that um, population. Next slide, please. Vegetation monitoring. And um, yes, I have, um, I could talk about this much longer than you'd probably care to listen to me talk about vegetation monitoring. So I will not dwell on it too long, but I know for some folks, this is of great interest. and I'm always happy to discuss it. So we did have a vegetation monitoring program for the, um, grazing program at San Marcos Foothills. And you can see those plots outlined in red on this map. Um, and the red, I mentioned that fish and wildlife supported restoration area. You can see that red circle kind of with plot 6C and 6D in it. So there were 29 monitoring plots across the San Marcos Foothills. We also installed plots on the West Mesa, which are not shown on this map. And these plots were monitored before and after the grazing program. So in 2018, and then again in 2022. Next slide, please. So beyond grassland species or beyond grass species, I talked about constituent species. So also I just wanna, there's this nice photo of some blue dicks or dipto, I think that's the old common, the old scientific name, but um, blue dicks, so, and also Hacente, Cinto del Desierto, um, a bold plant, very significant for our indigenous Chumash. They have utilized this plant as a food source for millennia, um, a very important constituent element to, it's actually a bryophyte, so it sprouts from a seed, so it should come back up. And um, yeah, it's definitely one of the things we monitor for out there in addition to the purple needle grass. So ideally, even if grazed, the um, blue dick should come back up. Next slide, please. So I do wanna to touch on fire. Um, our grazing program was primarily with an ecological emphasis, um, but we did see fire resilience co-benefits to our program. So here's a map that shows kind of the footprint of the cave fire and the Jesusita fire. So those of you that are local, I'm sure will recall both these events, but the larger red polygon is the Jesusita fire burn scar. 
um, in the southwest portion, burning into the San Marcos foothills, and then the blue hexagonal additions are the cave fire, which occurred actually in 2019. So actually after our first grazing cycle, and we've received some pretty direct via a letter from the county fire department that the prescribed grazing done in 2019 had some very explicit beneficial fire resilience results in regard to reducing the fuel load and the flashy fuels present from non-native grass loading. So we've definitely seen explicit fire benefits from this great fire resilience benefits from this grazing program. And um, I just wanted to emphasize that fire element and happy to discuss. I saw some questions in the Q&A already that kind of get at the overlap between these two objectives. And I'm happy to speak on that more and discuss that with folks directly. Um, next slide, please. So a bit of the grazing overview, some data, and I have more data we'll discuss, but I won't go too into it in this presentation. Um, the overview of the 2019, 2020, and 2021 grazing events. So you can see the amount of grazed days, the pastures grazed, the average acres grazed, and days giving us kind of a total acreage. I should point out 2022, 2020, excuse me, there were two grazing events. So generally about somewhere between 27 and just over 50 acres grazed in these events um, total. And then in 2023, which I have that data, but it's not in this presentation, it was actually just over 70 acres. And you can think of that as a product of those different compositions of the grasslands that I discussed um, towards the beginning of the talk. Next slide, please. So vegetation monitoring, and I won't go too in depth into this data, and I have data for every plot, and every plot's kind of its own unique site, and the ecology of this can get pretty interesting and complex, so I won't go too into that at the moment, but um, I do want to touch on the vegetation monitoring results. So out of the red dots that you saw at the start of the, that one map that showed various vegetation plots, this shows 27 different this so this this shows an example of one of those plots, kind of the change over time between 2018 and 2022. We also have 2020 data, but that's from August, so it's not as necessarily of a like for like comparison. So we do have before and after data. Um, 27 vegetation monitoring plots showed 21 of those showed an increase in percent native cover. Um, four plots showed no change, and two plots showed a decrease in percent relative native cover. And this is one point where I'll take the opportunity to mention there are many factors that go into what vegetation looks like beyond whether it's been grazed or not grazed. Um, rainfall is obviously very important. We touched on the fire aspect, so lots of these plots actually burned in 2019 following the 2018 monitoring. And we're seeing that change pretty dramatically this year now with the amount of rain we've had. So um, I won't go too into the dynamics of coastal sage scrub, but um, I can say that we're seeing some interesting stuff out there in regards to vegetation. But overall, we feel like the vegetation monitoring has shown the structural changes that we've desired um, in regards to thatch reduction and also some increase in bare ground between these perennial bunch grasses. But as I said, each of these is an individual site. So there's a lot to parse out here in regards to data. Next slide, please. So I will touch on the bird aspect now. Um, and I think vegetation, we have some pretty clear data that we can spend a lot of time with. The bird element, we do have monitoring data, but there's a lot of complexities to discuss when we talk about breeding avifauna, uh, breeding birds, and um, thinking about their presence and why they would be um, where they are. And just um, a few focal species of our project, the Western Meadowlark on the left there with its names on the right there, um, down by the grasshopper sparrow, a burrowing owl on the top right, and then um, a grasshopper sparrow down in the bottom right. So think of these as kind of our three focal species in regards to bird monitoring, because at one point, all three of these species were much more present on the San Marcos foothills than they are in the current, in the present. Um, I will point out that burrowing owl is actually from last year, it was seen on the Santa Barbara Christmas bird count. So somebody actually, Sophie Cameron went out there in the rain and was able to document a burrowing owl. And um, 
yeah, it's a fun one to have out there, but generally just seen in the winter. And I'll discuss some more specifics on these bird species in a moment. Next slide, please. So grasshopper, sparrow, and burrowing owl, we have some excellent data from a previous document, the San Marcos Foothills Coalition Stewardship Plan back prior to the um, county ownership of the preserve. So this is back actually when the entire area was privately held. Um, so some excellent data from about 20 years ago that shows pretty consistent grasshopper sparrow presence in the um, breeding season. So we'll touch on that a little bit more. Next slide, please. And also burrowing owl data. Um, so this map shows both those presences. So grasshopper sparrow, um, a species of concern at the California level, large declines in its population, generally it's just present here in the summer. So um, in the, um, that data I just touched on 20 years ago, um, we did have considerably more grasshopper sparrows present. And actually the number of individuals is one right now. There was one out there that I got to see briefly last week. But um, yes, this is a species that was consistently present on the foothills as recently as two decades ago. And then one of the hypotheses is, is actually that after cattle were removed from the property, the structure changed and then they were much less present. Um, so one of the hopes with the grazing programs was, can we shift that structure to make this a more welcoming habitat for grasshopper sparrow. Uh, next slide, please. Western meadowlark, um, another bird that, that has bred out there in the past, but is now not really seen as a breeder on the kind of Santa Barbara Goleta area. Um, you can find it in Northern Santa Barbara County as a breeder, but not the way it used to be. This species is very grassland dependent and obviously land use changes and um, other factors have very, heavily influenced that. Um, they are present at the foothills in the winter and there are still some present right now, but um, they generally are not around in the breeding season into the summer. So um, we'll see what they end up doing this summer on those grazed plots. Next slide, please. Uh, raptors, um, not a specific focus of our grassland monitoring. Um, our grassland are great prescribed grazing project, but I will touch on them briefly just because they kind of are the upper level of the ecosystem. So as the raptors go, kind of a good ecosystem indicator, um, Northern Harrier, red-tailed hawk, American kestrel, white-tailed kite. Um, the kites in particular are a very charismatic species locally that has been having major problems with our ongoing drought issues. So that's another one worth monitoring to see how it will respond now that that condition has shifted a little bit, at least in the short term. Um, next slide, please. Uh, burrowing owl. Um, I will touch on them a little bit. They're just so charismatic. Um, we do have burrowing owls locally in the winter. They are breeding in other areas of California still, the Central Valley, the Salton Sea, even down into um, San Diego County that way. So we do still have breeding burrowing owls in the state, but they have not bred in Santa Barbara County for many years at this point, um, but they do move through. We do get wintering owls and migratory owls. And that is one bird part I wanna mention here is even if we don't necessarily get breeding activity, it's very important to consider if you have wintering birds. So the burrowing owl is a great example of this, but it's also true for the Western Meadowlark. If you are preserving and enhancing the habitat in the local area and they use that for part of the year, that's very significant and, and it still helps them. And that's also one of the reasons this becomes very complex to talk about restoring habitat for migratory bird species because it's not just dependent on one area. So we can do the best job here and it might be impacted somewhere else. But um, yeah, the burrowing owls, um, generally we see one or two birds in the winter, but um, there has been some effort locally. Um, North Campus Open Space is a great example where they've put in some effort to restore burrowing owl habitat. But um, it's a tough one because they are undergoing a lot of threats, um, predation and also just habitat loss. Next slide, please. So kind of some takeaways on our 2023 grazing. And then after this, just one more slide. So our 2023 grazing, um, January 18th to February 26th, so relatively recently, um, as I mentioned with the vegetation monitoring, um, 20 more plots were put in. So we do plan to continue monitoring those 
Um, also control plots that were not grazed, so that comparison of grazed versus ungrazed. Um, and this is a good opportunity to kind of touch on, and Jenya hit on some of this, but I'll mention it quickly, um, some of the management practices and best management practices. So you can see the electric fencing here. You can see the Artemisia of the California sagebrush there on the right and in the back of the photo outside the fenced area. So as Jenya touched on, um, sheep will eat shrubs. Um, they are selective in what kind of shrubs they've eaten, but um, they will eat shrubs. So um, definitely considerations here for what you want to target in regards to grazing, um, how your impact on the land will occur. Um, so monitoring that is very important. It's something we take very seriously. Um, we don't want to, um, we want this to be effective. And thus far, we feel like it's had the desired results at the San Marcos foothills. Um, I'd be remiss, I should, excuse, I would be missing out if I didn't mention the importance of volunteers during this, um, effort, especially this recent one. Um, we had over 70 volunteer sheep docents who took part in this program. So in addition to CIR staff and um, we on the lamb actually out on the land and interacting with the public and explaining the program and pointing out the fence and that sort of stuff. Um, next slide, please. So kind of some takeaways and yeah, once again, that community involvement where feasible, um, I think that's really important. Obviously the sites vary, especially in regards to public access and that sort of element. But I think it's very important that um, there's community input and involvement and that these projects are done in a um, sensible manner. And, uh, and I touched on this a little bit, but thinking about fire versus ecology, um, where projects can be co-beneficial. And obviously our program was an ecologically focused program that had fire co-benefits. And I'd like to think that there can be fire focused programs that can have ecological co-benefits, but those two don't always necessarily perfectly line up. So thinking about how to really think about the impacts and mitigate for those and do monitoring that ensures we're achieving what we wanna do. And that's kind of my big takeaway is that and I think we heard this from some of the other speakers thinking about this as a management tool that can be used effectively or ineffectively. And um, I think that's where I'm gonna leave it, but I'm happy to um, discuss this further with folks and talk more about our program and get into some of the data with folks who are interested in that. But I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today and I'll pass it back to Molly. Thanks, Aaron. Um, before we move on to Brian, I just want to mention that we have Samantha on the chat. Um, she is Senator Lamone's staffer, and she'll be available via chat to answer questions directed to Senator Lamone for the next five minutes. So if you have any questions for the Senator, put them in the chat in the next five minutes. Um, but thank you, Aaron. We are now going to hear from Brian Schaub, um, Deputy Policy Director at the California Climate and Agriculture Network. Um, and Brian is going to talk a little bit about how CalCan has been working behind the scenes over the last few years to better understand kind of the state's wildfire risk and really dive deeply into how grazing can be better promoted as a solution. So. I'm going to pass it off to Brian and um, yeah. Well, thank you, Molly. And uh, thank you to the full CEC team supporting the webinar today. And hello to all of you who are joining. Um, I know we're doing simultaneous translations. So uh, please, Molly, if I start going too fast, jump in and, and slow me down. Um, all right, so in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about three things. The first is how wildfires are impacting farmers, farm workers, and climate change. The second is how prescribed grazing can prevent and reduce the risks of wildfires with some specific examples. And then the third is how Senate Bill 675 by Senator Lamone attempts to scale up this ecological solution. Um, first, to introduce myself and the coalition, uh, I wanted to share this photo of, of the coalition that makes up CalCan. Uh, this is from our last in-person retreat, and you can go to the next slide. And so we are a coalition of eight sustainable agriculture organizations in California that work to advance state and federal policy uh, to support 
climate solutions offered by farmers and ranchers. And uh, we formed in 2009 to be a progressive, uh, positive agricultural voice on climate issues. Next slide. So in the past six years or so, wildfire fires have taken a tremendous toll on the farmers, ranchers, and farm workers in our network. Some have lost property, crops, animals, and structures. Some have been evacuated multiple consecutive years in a row. And many have had costs like insurance premiums uh, rise dramatically or have lost their insurance policies altogether. And as outdoor workers, farmers, ranchers, and farm workers are exposed to extremely unhealthy levels of wildfire smoke as a result of these wildfires. Next slide. So from a climate perspective, um, it's clear that these increasingly high severity catastrophic wildfires are both exacerbated by and contribute to climate change. One recent study by UCLA found that the GHG emissions from the wildfires in 2020 alone, which was the year um, when four and a half million acres in the state burned, that the GHG emissions from that year alone from wildfires were the second largest source of GHG emissions in the state second only to the transportation sector and more than the electricity or industrial sectors. So to prevent this vicious cycle from getting worse, um, we need to use every tool available to scale up solutions to prevent and reduce the intensity and impact of wildfires. Next slide. So grazing can play a role uh, in a few ways. Um, the first is to prevent ignitions, human-caused ignitions. Many wildfire ign ignitions start near roads or highways or from power lines. Um, and this graphic shows uh, from Caltrans the methods that they use to reduce highly flammable vegetation near roads. Mowing and weed whackers um, depend on fossil fuels and can themselves spark fires. And herbicides are made from fossil fuels and have downstream environmental and health impacts. And so of all these methods, we argue that grazing is the most biological, nature-based, climate-friendly, and multi-beneficial method of reducing fuels next to roads and infrastructure. And the photo on the right is an example of where goats are being used to graze next to Highway and Hayward. Uh, and this is, this is a photo um, of some grazing done by Star Creek land stewards, who I, I think I saw are on the webinar. Um, and it's a, a photo from Cole Bush. All right, we can go to the next slide. Of course, um, we can't stop every wildfire, nor should we. Um, Many of our ecosystems evolved with low intensity fires started by lightning or um, were started through the practice of cultural burning by indigenous Californians. But when unplanned and uncontrolled fires start, our goal should be to keep them away from homes and communities and reduce the intensity of the wildfires. This photo from North Sonoma County Fire Chief Marshall Tuberville demonstrates how grazing can turn grasslands from a fire spreader into a fire barrier protect, to protect homes and, and communities. In the photo, the grazed area, which is in tan, uh, stopped the fire, which is in the darkened areas in the top right, um, and effectively protected the homes and structures uh, on the bottom half of the picture. And you can see that rec rectangle shape. Um, that's literally the pasture where the fire just stopped. Uh, stopped cold at the fence line. Um, all right, next slide. So grazing also can reduce wildfire intensity, which um, research from the UC Hoplands Research and Extension Center 
uh, has, a, found, has a number of environmental benefits. Um, in this case, uh, the area in the top left half of the picture was grazed and the bottom uh, right half uh, was not. And you can see pretty clearly from that photo that the, the uh, grazed area had less impact on the native oak species there um, by reducing the flame length and the temperature of the fire, it reduced the mortality of branches and trees. And they also found in, in studies of the fire um, in the recovery period that there were higher regeneration of native forbs and grasses in the area that was grazed, again, due to that um, lower fire temperature. We can go to the next slide. And of course, um, grazing is a, a helpful tool in protecting communities, especially areas that are too risky for controlled burns um, or where things like herbicides are frowned upon uh, for, for good reason. Um, so this is a clip from uh, my local news station here in Sacramento that covered a story where grazing done by some, some goats in West Sacramento um, effectively stopped a fire, an urban fire that was heading towards a, a multifamily housing complex. Next slide. So um, I'm gonna shift now to talking about um, the bill, Senate Bill 675, which, which CalCAN is sponsoring in the legislature. And um, as, uh, as Senator Lamone noted earlier, this, this bill was really inspired by a series of conversations and field days with um, rangeland and indigenous fire ecologists, with fire professionals, with environmental advocates like CEC and grazers um, that included the tour of Arroyo Hondo Preserve that, um, that CEC and CalCAN co-hosted with Senator Lamone in August. Um, and at that tour, Assemblymember Bennett, uh, who is also present, and Senator Lamone asked a number of thoughtful, critical questions, and they invited CalCAN and CEC to follow up with their staff to discuss next steps. Assemblymember Bennett, um, actually gets credit for uh, last year successfully advocating after that tour for the inclusion of prescribed grazing and prescribed grazing infrastructure in last year's budget bill. And then over the course of the fall and winter, CalCAN and CEC staff drafted the bill language uh, in consultation with Senator Lamone's staff, with prescribed grazers, with a group representing uh, county governments, and a number of environmental groups like the California Native Plant Society and Audubon, California. Next slide. So the bill does three things. And in the next three slides, I'm gonna walk through um, the, the three things the bill does. Um, so the first is uh, the, the bill um, incorporates prescribed grazing and um, and some support for prescribed grazing into the existing fire prevention grants program, which is housed at the CAL FIRE agency. And so the bill um, requires CAL FIRE to do additional outreach to um, increase support for grazing projects. And recognizing that CAL FIRE is not necessarily the expert on grazing or rangeland ecology, it also requires CAL FIRE to consult with the Board of Forestry's Range Management Advisory Committee, which is made up of rangeland ecologists and prescribed grazers. Um, the bill also requires the Fire Prevention Grants Program to include education on livestock management and community supported grazing, uh, like what the Ojai Valley Fire Safe Council is doing for its community supported grazing program. And the bill includes prescribed grazing equipment and infrastructure like fencing and livestock watering systems as eligible investments in the program. We can move to the next slide. So the second thing the bill does is um, incorporates prescribed grazing into the regional forest and fire capacity program. Um, and this photo is uh, on the right is a photo from Bianca Soares of Star Creek Land Stewards, um, who uh, participated in a CalCAN webinar a couple of years ago and, and told us about this project. And we see this as an example of the type of project that we hope this bill will result in, in more of. 
In this case, the uh, Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority up in Marin County uh, has supported Star Creek land stewards in piecing together multiple private and public properties into one prescribed grazing project. Um, and as you can see in the, in the photo there, it includes um, regional parks, cities, school land, private homeland, HOA property, uh, and a private ranch. And it's created this mosaic of um, wildfire resilience uh, in this community. And this actually, um, <laughs> uh, actually protected a community uh, a, a year or so later after this project started when a fire, you can see a little fire emoji in the top left corner started and started moving towards, um, towards those neighborhoods. And the areas where it was grazed is where, that, where it stopped. Um, and that was on a red flag warning high wind day. Um, and those firefighters credit that grazing with, with stopping that wildfire. Um, so um, so this, this bill funds local governments, city and county governments to do more projects like this, the planning, the permitting, the outreach, the education involved necessary to set up these projects. Um, to ensure that those governments have the expertise and guidance they need to do this effectively and ecologically, the bill requires uh, the Department of Conservation to work with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Range Management Advisory Committee I mentioned earlier, and University of California Livestock and Natural Resources Advisors to develop guidance on how to plan and manage uh, these types of grazing projects. Uh, we can go to the next slide. All right, and so lastly, this bill um, incorporates prescribed grazing into the state's Wildfire and Forest Resilience Task Force. This task force was uh, created a couple of years ago and has primarily focused on um, forest ecosystems to date, but is starting to move into more regional planning, including regional planning for the Central Coast uh, and the North Coast regions, which have different ecosystems, um, more shrublands, more grasslands, et cetera. And so this bill requires that task force, which includes um, a number of state agencies, uh, to develop a strategic action plan for supporting scaling up prescribed grazing near communities, in addition to the, the work they've been doing to promote more prescribed fire and other vegetation management practices. So um, that's the summary of the bill. Uh, we can go to the next slide, and this is my last slide. Um, if you are excited about this bill or curious to learn more, I would be happy to chat with you. Um, I've listed my email there. Um, uh, on the slide and um, would welcome you to, to support the bill if, if you feel so moved. Um, they're gonna drop a chat that looks like they did a form in the chat that's a Google form to register your support for the bill um, and would love to have your organization uh, listed alongside these other supporters here uh, that have agreed to support the bill so far. Um, so that's my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Brian. Um... Yeah, we are going to move on to the Q&A portion, and I think since we have you, Brian, we might as well start with you. Um, there's a few questions it looks like you were going to answer live, so maybe we can start with those two, um, and I, I can read them aloud, and then you can answer. Um, so the first one is AB 1099 uh, concerns, if not passed fire goat grazers will go out of business in January, 2024. Is this possible? Do you, do you have an answer to this, Brian? Yes, I do. And um, hello, Tim. Uh, uh, I know Tim, I've, I've talked to him about this issue. So um, yeah, so the, the issue that Tim is raising is that um, historically, uh, sheep herders and goat herders have been trade, treated the same way in California law based on a law that um, created a, a specific set of protections for, for sheep herders, uh, given their very unique job. Um, unfortunately, uh, last year, um, somewhat suddenly and unexpectedly, the um, Department of Industrial Relations uh, decided or determined that because goat, goats and goat herders are not explicitly mentioned in that sheep herder law, that goat herders should be treated uh, differently. 
and um, that uh, effectively, and I won't get into all the details to explain how this works, but um, would require goat herders to start paying, or sorry, goat grazing operations to start paying goat herders $14,000 a month, um, which, uh, you know, I think would make all of us consider becoming goat herders. <laughs> That's a very high salary thing. Um, so, um, so there is an effort, uh, there was an effort last year in the legislative session to clarify that sheep and goat herders should be treated the same way in the law um, and should be paid similar wages. Um, and unfortunately, uh, there was a sunset provision included in that legislation that um, basically resulted in goat herders and sheep herders being treated the same for one year. And then that will end uh, in 2024. And so um, the goat uh, herders and or goat grazing operations that we work with are understandably wanting to um, to see that uh, sunset provision removed. And and again, just sort of go back to the way we've always uh, treated sheep and goat herders, which is uh, it's a similar job, similar occupation. They should be treated the same. And um, so there is there is a bill underway, uh, AB 1099, to address that. Um, so, uh, that, that's my quick sort of context and background of that. Um, I certainly will be talking to, um, folks in the legislature about that, at Thanks. least from my, from my, my position. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So there's another one we have for you, but let's give you a, a chance to drink some water. And um, we'll come back to you. So um, just so everyone knows, a, a lot of questions have been answered. And if you click on the Q&A, you can see the answers there. But I think there's some that are worth kind of going over um, again. So I'm going to read one and address it to Jenya. Um, and it's, I'm going to I'm going to kind of mix a couple of questions together. Um, so there's been a few questions in the Q&A about how grazing actually promotes um, invasive or uh, decreases invasive uh, species and increases uh, or promotes natives. So could you maybe just give a little bit more um, color to that process? Sure. Um, well, I would definitely include, like those are kind of two different things like first for controlling invasives um, one you can use timing as one of your strategic tools so um, can you get a plant when it is kind of at a vulnerable state which is usually when it's moved from productive period uh-oh we may have Jenya frozen Aaron, do you have, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, Seems like Jenya's back, but I'm happy to jump in, but I'll let Jenya finish. Okay. Um, or once something has gone to seed, like I said, by far most seed um, becomes unviable through the digestive tract of a ruminant. Um, so you're going to reduce the seed. And a lot also what you're doing is when you get rid of that plant, you're giving an opportunity for other plants to come in. But I definitely want to say that there's, it's not at all like a magic remedy where you just like graze an invasive area and then you have like a native bunch grass stand, like that would be lovely. But um, so you, so when I was talking about increasing biodiversity in these like mustard stands, we're transform, you know, we're, we're moving it from just absolute homogenous monocrop of mustard to a more diverse group of native plants, which is part of like a succession, you, you know, I mean, we're only five years old, so we've only been able to watch five years of transformation. Obviously, ecological processes are incredibly long. And I think one of the just more important pieces is that is, is having people who are working on the ground and engaged in a specific place and a specific ecology over the years so that we can continue to uh, work with it and be part of its transformation and are invested in that. Um, but yeah, it's it's one thing to transition away from a specific invasive plant. It's a whole other thing to transition to a native ecology. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Jenya. 
Um, all right, so I'm going to pull together a few other questions and address it to Aaron. Um, and you can just speak from, from your uh, personal experience um, working for Channel Islands Restoration, but there's been some questions about, you know, the utility utility of cattle, um, and maybe you could just talk through your reason reasoning of why, you know, sheep were the best um, suited for uh, for your project. Yeah, and definitely cattle are really important to consider both within the context of what we're discussing here and the specific context of the San Marcos foothills history because that was grazed with cattle for more than a century and had impacts. And I mean, cattle are generally left on the land without rotation or removal. Um, and there's not necessarily service providers who offer kind of the sheep or goat um, option of bringing stock to a property so that sort of option and then cattle while they graze in a similar manner to sheep um, they will have a heavier impact on the land so i mean there is a big consideration there of how many stock you have on a parcel um, but yes i mean i think especially in the context of preserving rangelands i mean i mentioned there was one question in the chat asking about kind of California Department of Fish and Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services opinions about grazing in critical habitat areas and in general like a lot of those correlate to riparian areas and generally from best management perspective and we certainly didn't do this at the foothills you're not grazing in riparian areas but um, I will say that I've seen some literature actually from a little north in the state but even up in northern Santa Barbara County that like California tiger salamander critical habitat can actually benefit from grazing so I know the Fish and Wildlife Service has worked with grazers, specifically cattle grazers, to try to benefit tiger salamander habitat. So, I mean, the ecology stuff gets relatively complicated, and I'm certainly not the cattle expert, but um, I know there are folks who know quite a bit about it. So they are one of the options, but from a service provider perspective, I think it's a little trickier than some of the smaller stock. Yeah, and I would maybe add to that that um, that you know, in, in high trafficked areas like yours that have significant recreation uses that that might be a consideration as well. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really get into the recreation stuff at the foothills, but that's certainly another part of that picture. Yeah. Um, all right. So another question for Brian that he is going to answer live, <laughs> um, was around does this bill address environmental compliance and the costs associated yeah so um because uh projects funded under both the fire prevention grants program and the regional forest and fire capacity program are state funded um they will have to go through the uh, CEQA or California Environmental Quality Act process, which is a public process um, that requires environmental review and if there are significant impacts, um, potential mitigation. Um, so it is, it's correct that that is a, a barrier to scaling up prescribed grazing. Um, and uh, the way this bill would address that is by one, um, the cost of that environmental compliance can be included in the grants funded by either of these programs. Um, and the regional forest and fire capacity program includes as one of its objectives explicitly supporting local and county uh, or city and county governments um, in doing the, the paperwork and the process they need to do to, to comply with CEQA. Um, so that, that's explicitly sort of part of the program. Thanks, Ryan. Mm -hmm. All right, another question for you, Jenya. Um, so wanna, so wanna, in the Q&A, someone has asked you, what is the biggest hurdle that grazing outfits like Kuyama Lamb and others are facing in successfully executing grazing projects, logistics, scalability, et cetera? Um, I think our biggest hurdle is um, just making enough money to have this be a viable livelihood. Um, so the cost, the true cost per per acre and per project, you know, is is yeah, sub is substantial. Um, and it's just a ton of work. So to make that feel 
um, like you're really being compensated for for that work it just takes a lot. Beyond that, um, you know, I mean, honestly, I'm I'm really excited about this bill and this kind of policy support because the the scale of projects that um, has is becoming available through the the first Cal Fire grant that. Um, we received in Santa Barbara this year kind of makes this work um, feel very viable. Um, it's an enormous puzzle to piece together where all of your animals are going to get fed throughout the year um, when contracts are not guaranteed. So um, having big regional plans um, and have you know, contractors integrated into those regional plans makes things feel possible in a way that they didn't before. Um, and then availability of infrastructure um, is definitely another another piece. So, yeah. Thank you. All right. So I think we have time for one more question, and I'll I'll let you all add your your thoughts to it. Um, but I think I'll start maybe with Brian. Um, so looking forward, what is the expected demand of prescribed grazing? And um, do we have any sense of how many animals are going to be needed? What kind of limitations there are? What type of incentives are going to be promoted? Um, and what are their priorities in terms of giving access to the program to underserved communities and vulnerable communities in the in the WUI or the wildlife urban interface. I actually wonder if I can turn the first part of that question over to Jania around demand, um, since you're the person actually getting you know requests. I have not done the numbers on that. Um, yeah, I'm so regionally focused that as far as like the state of California and the actual acres where this would be viable. Um, I wonder if somebody else on the call has done those numbers. And, but um, yeah, I feel like I, I would be um, I would be making things up too much to to really answer that. Um, I. I remember somebody who had said something like if there were 50 operators doing 2,000 acres a year, um, which I guess is like 100,000 ac treated acres a year, I don't know if those are accurate numbers or not. And we have far fewer um, operators than that at the moment. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I think I'll just say that um, Part of the intent of the including prescribed grazing, local and prescribed grazing plans in the regional forest and fire capacity is to give um, entities like fire safe councils, local and county governments, the funding they need to, to actually map um, ecosystems and where different vegetation treatments are, are needed. Um, so in essence, like, part of the objective of this uh, bill is to help those entities at a local level better understand what the need is and then how to scale up the, um, the grazing and, and infrastructure to support that. Um, and as for underserved communities, I think one of the conversations that we had at um, the Community Supported Grazing Summit in Ojai uh, last spring, which I know Molly and, and Janie were both there for, um, is that one of the barriers to scaling this up is that um, it, it's difficult for grazing operations to um, handle projects that are on a small scale. Um, so I've heard uh, one grazing operation we work with say they don't do projects less than 25 acres. I've heard others say we don't do anything less than 10 acres um, because the fixed costs of setting up fence, watering system, moving the livestock, um, making a plan, it, it doesn't pencil out currently for a single smaller property. The way to get around that is to um, fund outreach uh, so that multiple proper property owners can, can sort of work together to have one project. Um, and we've seen an example of that 
one of our coalition members, the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, um, received some funding from a resource conservation district in Sonoma County to work with their neighbors, adjacent landowners. Um, and this is part of a program called the Landsmark Grazing Program to do that kind of outreach and coordinated effort to create these larger projects so that it is more affordable for um, smaller scale property owners. Um, so that's uh, one answer to that. Yep. Well, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Jenya. Thank you, Aaron. Um, we are going to wrap up now with a poll um, and some gratitudes. So, um, so yeah, can we put the poll up, please? Okay, thank you. Did you listen to the webinar in English or Spanish? All right, thank you for answering the poll. And thank you again for everyone, um, all of our speakers today, including Senator Lamone and her staffer, Samantha, um, and Javi and Naira of Rooted Language uh, Services for interpreting uh, for us today. Um, we also would like to thank our sponsors, Cox and Marburg Industries. We are really grateful for your support. Um, and thank you, everyone in the audience, for showing up uh, and taking this important step to protect our climate. Um, free events like this are just one of the ways that CEC works to advance rapid and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. Um, events like this are only made possible because of donations from individuals like yourself. As you consider your yearly investments, no matter the amount, we hope you would consider a gift to our work. CEC is one of only a handful of nonprofits in Santa Barbara to hold the highest rating possible on both Charity, Navigator, and GuideStar. Uh, you can visit the QR code on the screen or visit cecsb.org forward slash donate. Um, look for a follow-up email in the next few days that will have a recording of this webinar, contact information um, for everyone, for all the presenters and other resources that we shared in the chat today. Um, we'll also include a list of upcoming events, including CEC's Santa Barbara Earth Day Festival, which will be back in Alameda Park on April 29th and 30th uh, for the first time since 2019. Um, so thank you all for tuning in to our CEC webinar series. Um, and if you haven't already, please consider joining our newsletter um, and engage with us on your favorite social media channel. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.